an account of the heroic Hebrews is they served as a great encouragement to all of God's people. That you can stand up for what is right and whether or not, and these are my words or my opinion, even though we may be consumed by their anger, they cannot destroy our soul. And so as we see in, in, in this account, it was important for them not to give in to Nebuchadnezzar in any way, shape, or fashion. They refused to compromise their religion. And when I read such accounts as this, or you go into the New Testament and you read accounts, the very first thing that I think of in that reading is do I have the same courage? Would I stand my ground knowing that, that I was going to make somebody of great worldly power very angry and that he could take my life? Would I still stand for what I believe? Or would I compromise and say, ooh, just a little bit of worship's not going to hurt? They didn't compromise one inch. And so it is that there are three simple truths about these three men. Number one, the very first truth is, is that they were different. They were different than all the other captives that they had brought into Babylon because they would not dine at the devil's table. They wouldn't eat with Nebuchadnezzar. They wouldn't worship his idols. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to teach them a lesson. And I often wonder who did receive the lesson. We also see is that they were dedicated. They would not dance to the devil's music. They had a whatever kind of an orchestra you would have. And part of the commands was to, to follow into this, but they, they refused. They refused to dine with him. They refused to dance. They refused to stand in front of Nebuchadnezzar's idol in worship. And as a result of that, they were delivered. They did not die in the devil's fire. Three things, to repeat myself. They were individuals that were different, they were dedicated, and they were delivered. And it makes me wonder that in my own life, am I dedicated? Am I as determined? Am I willing to be different? Now, I'm going to tell a story on myself, and, and I don't like to self-brag, but a little won't hurt. But I was working for a company, and one of the things that we did in this, in, in the course of my job is I installed certain equipment. And we had uh, some equipment that was going to be installed at the college. Registration, I mean, was that close. The equipment hadn't come in. And the lady was almost calling me hourly. And I finally calmed her down by saying, I understand the importance of what you do. I will be on the phone with our corporate, with our corporate headquarters. I'll find out what's going on. The very minute that equipment arrives, I will be down there to install it for you. And so sometimes I would call her rather than her call me. When it was all said and done, We were talking after the event, and she said, where do you go to church? And I told her. And she said, I knew there was something different about you. By the way that I treated her, by the way I treated the, the necessity that she felt, and she knew that I was on her side to get this task done. How many times do we, as we go about our daily activities, in whatever community that we live in, 
where people see us as different and unique individuals because of our relationship with God. And that's kind of what it ran into in that same situation with, with Nebuchadnezzar and these three Hebrews. Because these individuals would not bend, they would not bow, they, they would not burn. There was nothing that Nebuchadnezzar could do to them that would be of harm to them because God was using these three Hebrews to teach Nebuchadnezzar a lesson. And so it is, God's men were delivered by the power of the protection that he offers unto them. On the other hand, there is the other type of fire that God's people could use a little more of in their daily life. The Bible testifies John the Baptist of saying with regard to Christ that he was, burnt, he was a burning and shining light. This is found in John, three, uh, John 5 in verse 35. There is certainly some biblical truth in the idea that Christians can be on fire for God. One of the things that Jeremiah said in another context, but the idea is still the same. He says that your word burns like fire in my bones. And I've thought about that passage many, many times over the years. That our love and understanding for the word of God burns like fire in our bones. That we are that dedicated, that we are that purposeful in our lives. Jesus declared that the love of many shall wax cold towards that which is of his mission. And I think that one of the things that he's trying to tell us is, is that in the church that is to be established, that love can wax cold as well. And in fact, in the, in the letters to the seven churches of Asia, pretty well testifies to the fact that even those that were on fire, those that were very engaged in the church, were in the same congregations that were written letters in Revelation. Jesus tells us that there has been many times when God's redeemed people need that fire rejuvenated. They need to have that fire fanned into flame. And as a result of it, that we can be better than what we are. I don't know about you, but I get so caught up in life, I forget about why I'm here. I forget about what my purpose is in life, on this planet, not just here in Wheeling. But everywhere we go, we are a testament like these three Hebrews were as to the fact of our love for God. We need fire. Number one, we need fire in our pulpits. In 1 Timothy, in the 4th chapter, in the 12th verse. No, it's not the 12th, it's the 1st verse. In the first five verses, Timothy says, I solemnly charge you at, uh, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge, the, uh, who will judge the living and the dead for his appearance in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire. I think that is so descriptive of our world today. 
People don't want the truth or the reality. But they want to have, as Paul told Timothy, their ears tickled so that to a point they no longer hold hard to the vast truth of teachers or of teaching. Preachers tend to want to preach something that is social, something that is acceptable. We don't want to hurt feelings. Neither do I. But I want to teach the truth. And until we have fire back in our pulpits teaching the truth of the Word of God, then I don't see how we can be in accordance to, to what is described in Daniel with Eshach, Meshach, and Abednego. That they are willing to stand firm. We will be like the three little pigs in the stick house. When he blows, it's just going to collapse because it needs the strength of bricks in order to stand. And you are those bricks, according to Peter. You are that which builds the church, Christ the cornerstone, and then we become the individual bricks that make the structure that holds it strong. But if we don't have strong teaching, if we don't understand the truth, if we're not willing to apply the truth, then we will be consumed by the things of this world. And even though Nebuchadnezzar in his fiery furnace is long since gone, there still could be fire in our future. And God does not want anybody to be in that situation. We need more fire, not only in our pulpits, but also in our closets of prayer. Praying earnestly. You know that, that when, they, when they pray, we find that in Acts 4 and 31, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, you know that I'm, I'm referring to the fact of the Spirit being delivered unto these individuals. The fire that is so needed is so important that in our prayers, that can change things. I don't expect the earth to shake. I don't expect that I will see any audible or physical sign of change. But what I do expect, that when I pray earnestly, not for my own selfish gain, but when I pray for the behalf of others, for my family, my children, your children, all of those, that if it is sincere, that God will listen and that it will make a difference. But sometimes as I reflect back in my own life, many of my prayers are like grocery lists when instead they need to be love letters. Letters of appreciation for what we have, for what God has given us. We need a lot more fire in our persuasion of those that are outside of the body of Christ. As he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your endurance as well. It's important that we bring people to Christ. You know, it's, it's time for people to put away their excuses. Don't you think that it is time that we stand fast for what we believe in? Don't you think it's time we put aside 
the things that keep us from being of true and pure service to God.